Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Indeed, the United States was at peace with that nation, looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Japan has therefore undertaken a surprise offensive extending throughout the Pacific area. Hostilities exist. There is no blinking at the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. With confidence in our armed forces, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. It is January 1944. A massive fleet of U.S. warships under Admiral Chester Nimitz is moving westward toward Micronesia. The fleet, now headed to Kwajalein in the Marshalls, has as its mission the seizure of Japan's island possessions. The course of the war in the Pacific has been reversed. Just six months after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese advance had been halted. American forces, now on the offensive, fought their way through the Solomon Islands and New Guinea, neutralizing the Japanese forward base on Rabaul and forcing Japan to retract its defensive position to Micronesia. Meanwhile, Nimitz's fleet has just seized the island of Tarawa in the Gilberts after several days of bitter fighting. The fleet is advancing toward the heart of Micronesia. Island people and the Japanese defense forces assigned to protect their islands wait in anticipation of the assault to come. Micronesians had felt the effects of the war for the past four years. The war started in 1941, but before that, the Japanese began bringing in all kinds of weapons and food and supplies. In 1940, lots of Japanese soldiers were brought in and divided among the lagoon islands of Chuk. Some were sent to seas, along with many weapons of war. We Chukis began to get suspicious, wondering why they were bringing in so many guns.
Beginning in late 1940, small naval detachments were stationed in the islands. Within a year, the total naval force grew to about 6,000 men. Another 10,000 Japanese civilians were brought in to beef up the labor force. Conscripted labor, at first Koreans and then Japanese prisoners, had been brought in to work on the airstrips on several of the islands. Angar in Palau, Saipan, Three Fields in Chuuk, and four in the Marshalls. When this imported labor proved inadequate, islanders were conscripted to assist in the construction of the airfields and base facilities. These local labor forces were moved around the islands as their services were needed. Then, in late 1942, the Japanese battleships Yamato and Musashi, the pride of the Japanese Navy, were berthed in Chuuk for a year. Admiral Isoraku Yamamoto, in his dress whites and braid, became a familiar figure as he surveyed the fleet from the bridge of his ship. This massive military buildup was leaving its imprint on just about every aspect of life in the local community. Families were losing their young men to conscript labor and their land to the Navy to provide housing for naval personnel and civilian laborers. They were taken as conscript laborer before the war and then when the war started, then they start working on sword defenses and uh, uh, airport, you know, they were forced to do that. But this was nothing compared with what islanders would have to endure after the arrival of Japanese garrisons in 1944. Army troops were moved into Micronesia, a division of 10,000 men to each major island group, a total of 50,000 troops in all. These units were arriving to defend islands that until then had served as advanced bases for the Japanese offensive thrust across the Pacific. There were times my mother and aunties came home sick from the beating they endured at work. They were forced to push heavy carloads of dirt, but even a little mistake would result in a beating. Army troops commandeered houses and food trees to provide for the military needs. Widespread famine would soon strike the islands, with strict punishments meted out to people for infractions against military regulations. So all the food was supposed to be for soldiers only, and they had put some kind of martial law on controlling the food distribution. Uh, even coconut has to be given to the Japanese soldiers first. If we were to get something from our own land, they would chase us and beat us up. They said the land was theirs not ours. My father-in-law told me that the Japanese, they accused him of picking breadfruit from his own breadfruit tree. So they, uh, they beat him up, start at his foot all the way up to his head, his back. They just beat him, beat him and beat him uh, until he couldn't stand. Japan was readying its islands for the attack it knew was to come.
前に変わりって踏み四つ悠々心の勇ましさ観光の声に送られて今ぞ入り立つ父母の国片たずは生きて帰らんと悠々心の勇ましさ In January 1944, vast U.S. carrier forces were assigned to move into enemy controlled waters and carry out a raid on the Marshall Islands, a strong link in Japan's outer defense ring. The Marshall Islands constituted a block in the path of the U.S. drive westward. At Kwajalein, the world's largest coral atoll, the main objectives were three small islands. For weeks, liberators of the 7th Air Force pounded the atolls in the eastern and central marshal, softening up enemy strong points by strafing and bombing. I was born during the uh, during the war, and 24 hours a day, you know, they bomb. That's why they call me Marok. Marok means in English is dark, because I was born in the dark, no light, inside the bunker. After softening up the islands, American assault troops stormed Kwajalein Atoll, the major Japanese base in eastern Micronesia. U.S. troops landed without much resistance, but still the battle raged on for four days while the defenders sniped from behind the ruins of buildings, fired from pillboxes, and threw themselves at charging American tanks. At the battle's end, only 200 of the defenders were taken alive. A week after the first assault, Kwajalein Atoll was in American hands. Prior to this, most of the Marshallese had been evacuated to other islands, where they provided for their families as best they could and said their goodbyes to their Japanese friends. My father was involved in the evacuation of Marshallese from Jalut. He went to the Japanese radio operator and he knew the guy so well that he went to him and he said, can you talk to the Japanese to surrender? Because the Americans will take care of you, take you back to Japan after, you know, after everything is finished. And his response was, you know, if I do that, my family you know, at home will disown me. There is no honor in that. And the two guys <laughs> held each other and cried, and, and my father went on to tell the Marshallese to assemble on this side of the island because they're gonna bomb this side. With the loss of Kwajalein and Eniwetok, four other Japanese bases in the Marshalls were neutralized as well, and so the Marshalls could be safely bypassed onward to the Carolines. The U.S. now had possession of two key atolls in the Marshall Group. For from the Marshalls, the U.S. Air Force was in excellent position to launch attacks against the Carolin Islands in a giant island hopping operation which would take American fighting forces to the very doorstep of Japan itself. On Eniwetok Atoll, a strip capable of accommodating four squadrons of fighters was hurriedly finished. 
The target, the group of islands called Truk, was the most important enemy staging area between Japan and the Southwest Pacific. The legend of Truk's invincibility was about to be punctured effectively. But en route to Chuuk lay Kushrai and Ponape with their Japanese garrisons. From both land and sea, U.S. forces began a series of raids against the Caroline Islands, which would render them useless for military purposes. In February 1944, air attacks began on Kushrai and Ponape. I was visiting Colonia at the time. I was paddling back from Colonia near the bridge and there were planes fighting over it. When the planes were shooting above me, the bullets were flying everywhere. If they had hit me, I would have been killed. I was lucky. They fell into the water like someone was throwing stones into the sea. I remember myself uh, climbing, uh, climbing the trees, you know, to watch the, the fight in the air, you know. Oh, it was amazing. Really amazing, you know, you see the plane diving down, you know, burning down. That's how I, we got to know that the American plane were very strong and they have a, a much better gun, you know. Because all the, all the Japanese planes were, were shut down. Ponape was also frequently bombed. As one Spanish Jesuit put it after a two-day firebomb attack, Colonia, the capital of the island, no longer exists. But the real prize for the Allies was a heavily fortified Japanese base at Chuuk. From Kwajalein in mid-March, 7th Air Force bombers began a series of strikes against that enemy stronghold. In a single month in early 1944, U.S. Air Force planes dropped a total of 1,813 tons of bombs on truck. At the crack of dawn, we were awakened by the sounds of explosions. Everyone ran outside, even me as a little kid. We were all stunned as we looked up in the sky and it turned red and sparkled with explosions. Some people realized these were bomb bursts and told us to run for cover. Then we started running to the trees and hid ourselves. But everyone soon learned what an air raid meant. My mother was scared of the sound of an airplane. If she heard a plane coming, she would immediately wake us up with a slap and yell, Get out of here! Yes, sir. We scrambled around looking for mango trees or any kind of tree nearby so we could hide under it. We were never really sure if we would be safe or not.
One of the main targets of U.S. planes were the ships at anchor in the lagoon. There were about 30 Japanese ships moored around the islands. More than 30 U.S. planes started racing towards the ships, attacking them, seeing who could hit them first. I looked around and all the ships were sinking, and the ocean turned black from the oil of the ships. At that moment, I was scared and shaking. I started praying to God, Lord, please have mercy. Put your hands over me so I can hide under them. I was thinking of my family at that moment and I started crying. I was asking the Lord to take care of me because I thought I would never see my family again. The attacks were highly successful. In less than four months, once mighty truck was to become virtually useless to the enemy. The enemy's stronghold was reduced to a mere shell. All hands, all hands. Now hear this. The objective of this task force is the Palau Islands. By occupying these islands, we will complete the sealing off of the important Jap strongholds to the east. The amphibious force which moved northwestward through the far Pacific was to strike at the base of the Palau chain, Palau and Angaur. On September 15, 1944, the assault was begun on Palau Island. Before the assault troops stormed ashore on Palau, the last pre-invasion airstrikes were made. I was in our village, and then we went swimming, and we saw all this plane. Uh, we couldn't see the sky. So we were saying, oh, look at all this, and we were jumping. And so some are coming, and we wait, we wait, jumping. But then after we, we, we realized it seems the land is moving, But we're still enjoying because we never knew what this war is. But then very soon we start to move toward the mountains because already the, the, the Americans, they were shooting everywhere. before making the coordinated move toward the beaches. In the face of withering enemy fire, they pushed ahead. Casualties on the beaches were heavy. The Japanese soldiers were well dug in, and the fighting on Peleliu continued for months. For many of the soldiers hidden away in caves, starvation was a greater threat than attacking Americans. Yeah, they were very in bad shape. They eat snakes, they eat uh, uh, how do, uh, lizard, they eat rats. Whatever they find, they eat.
Finally, after 74 days of battle, the islands were declared secure. In taking two key islands in the Palaus, the stars and stripes flew over the most westerly of the Carolyn Islands after a campaign which ranked with the most bitterly fought of the war in the Pacific. The war with Japan had several memorable turning points. In the struggle for the Marianas in the summer of 1944, the enemy's leaders realized that if U.S. forces were successful at Saipan, Japan could prepare itself for eventual defeat. This was their last line of defense. You could have, I have a video that has, shows the arc of the Marianas and how important it is for the defense against possible attack from the uh, east. And for us, it was the same thing. The classical target, we had to have those islands in order to get, uh, start bombing the mainland Japan. Very lucky, my friends got plenty of kids. So we find the small kids, like 45 people, very small, you cannot stand up. We have to sit in all the time and just do like this. And During the day, we just keep quiet, keep silent and hiding. At night, when it's getting dark, we go out to get some sweet potato, uh, uh, sugar cane, water. 19 days we stay inside the cave. 19 days, but one week no food, no drink. Because before that, all the men can go and get the water from the spring, and I can get uh, coconuts to drink. Or my brother can cook sometime, but after the big bump down, after that, my brother didn't cannot cook anymore because the smoke can see. Ships of the United States 5th Fleet have brought 100,000 troops and a quarter million sailors to the Marianas. Saipan is the first target. Saipan, headquarters of Japan's Central Pacific Fleet, commanded by Admiral Nagumo, the same Nagumo who smashed Pearl Harbor. June 11, 1 o'clock Sunday. They have the microphone, they running on the street and say, Kushu Keo, Kushu Keo. And after that, they, the ship, when the ship's coming every place, and if the big light, then after that, boom, the canyon is coming. The plane came and bombed into the, to the cave. Hi, everybody's crying, everybody's calling their children, their husbands, because exploded. Eh? So the people are bombed into another place. So these legs, men's legs, or my skirt also must be hit by the bomb, no? So right away, we take whatever we can take and we run away from that cave. My father gather us together and we pray and each one of us drink the sayonara, sayonara sign, drink, that uh, we will meet again. We might not meet again, but um, at this point, we need to separate because we never know all of us will die here in the center of this. So your children, the big ones, the four big ones, go and go to Chacha, and we'll meet there in that cave. Uh, after that, I didn't see anybody except one. By July 7th, U.S. forces had seized the major part of the island. Thousands of Chamorros, whose homes had been demolished, 
walked into the American lines at the first opportunity. Many tomorrows had been hiding in caves for more than a week with little food and water. Some were on the edge of starvation when they came into American hands. One of the great stories that I picked up is about a uh, Lieutenant Maury, and he fell in love with Saipan. He called all of his Chamorro friends together and said, look, folks, uh, the Americans are not going to be bad guys if they know who you are, basically. So when you go up, you go up and hide, find a cave or a good, good place to hide, and take all the food and water you can, and be sure to take something from the church, a crucifix, an icon of some kind, doesn't matter what. And the Americans come to your hiding place, stick that out first. And they'll know you're not Japanese. So when the soldier came, and my mom the first, my mom, my neighbor, no, my mom can you speak like that. My mom said, Chamorro men, Cristiano men, Catholic men, past Chamorro. And everybody follow. So one of my brothers been in Guam, and he just stuck here and he learning three languages. Hello, friend, never mind, I don't know. Hello, friend, never mind, I don't know. So the Americans say, come down, come down. <laughs> By the end of August, Tinian and Guam were also taken. The U.S. used these bases to launch air raids against Okinawa, Iwo Jima, and Japan itself. The culmination came in August 1945, when a bomber lifted off from Tinian to drop the first nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, then a few days later on Nagasaki. But you see, it's hard, it's really, because nobody knows the effect of World War II on Micronesians. How many Micronesians lost their lives? The fighting in the Pacific was over, but the effects would be felt for many years afterwards. Micronesians had endured hunger and hardship, but as one refugee said, never mind, we'll drink our tears. After nearly four years, the enemy had surrendered. The war was over. On the U.S. battleship Missouri and Tokyo Bay, early on the morning of September 2nd, 1945, a few hundred U.S. servicemen witnessed the climax of four years of war in the Pacific. It's my earnest hope and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, peace be now restored to the world, and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. The formal surrender of the Japanese nation on the deck of the Missouri was followed by other dramatic surrender ceremonies. At Chuk, the Japanese commanding officers, General Mugikura and Admiral Chuichi Hara, boarded the USS Portland and signed the document of surrender on the quarterdeck. 
Four years of war were ended in a simple ceremony that lasted not much more than an hour. A dozen other surrenders took place on different islands in Micronesia. Now the islands were officially in the hands of the U.S. Islanders, curious but wary, slowly emerged from their hiding places to find out for themselves what they might expect of their new overseers. What they found couldn't have been more Micronesian. That was the days of plenty, you know. The Americans came in with all kinds of food. They gave us uh, corned beef, they gave us uh, peanut butter, they gave us uh, biscuit, cheese too, and butter, butter too. But they were good kind. I don't see they sell nowadays. They are really the best kind, really good, yeah. And uh, they, of course they couldn't read, so if they want to eat, uh, uh, what's that, corned beef? They just open all the cans until they open a corn beef, can of corned beef and they eat it. Micronesians were feeling good again and were eager to build a good relationship with their liberators. Children would stand at attention and salute as soldiers passed by. And on many islands, the Star Spangled Banner was sung for arriving soldiers. Basically, as soon as the war was over and Japan had surrendered, uh, the Japanese, Okinawans, and Koreans who were in Camp Susupe were all gathered up together and they brought some freighters down uh, from Japan and they sent all, almost, almost all of the Koreans and Japanese and Okinawans back to their homes. There was a residue, maybe 25 or 30 people who were allowed to remain if they were married locally or had some other connection. On Chuuk, there were still 38,000 Japanese soldiers left over from the war, twice as many as the number of Chuukis. Nearly all were shipped back to Japan by the end of 1945, but approximately 5,000 were held to do cleanup work on the islands. was when the Japanese lost the war, there was no smooth transition. The Americans came in, and the policy that they carry out was to repatriate all the Japanese. So there were a lot of broken families. In addition to that, the Japanese were the one who run the, uh, the power plants. They're the one who run the water system. They're the one who teach schools. So when they repatriate all the Japanese, it created the vacuum. The transition from Japan to the, uh, the Americans was not a very close one. Uh, everything had to start all over again. The economy, the education, the politics, everything. Because, you know, you have to remember, the war just ended. 
all of these guys have been, you know, fighting in the Pacific for, I don't know, four or five years or maybe more. And they're anxious to go back home. As such, there was no massive rebuilding effort to replace what the Japanese had built before the war. Temporary naval structures would have to do. In place of the quaint little Japanese shops and houses fronted by twin torii, military-style Quonset huts mushroomed. They're all over the place. Uh, several stores in uh, Chalancanoa were Quonset huts. I've got a picture of the marine base in uh, Marpi, which is maybe a thousand Quonset huts, because after the uh, invasion after the islands were secured, there were 100,000 American troops on Saipan for the landing they anticipated on Japan. So there were Quonset huts all over the place. There was such plenty in these years that military materiel of all sorts was turned over to the civilian population. After the war, the Jeeps were sold by the Navy at five dollars a piece because we had thousands of them on Tinian. You can see on the 4th of July, the guys bring out their Jeeps and parade them. I think there's 10 or 15 of them that are still operating. But even a five dollar Jeep or a twenty dollar Quonset hut cost money. How were Micronesians to earn a living in these early post-war years? For a time, Micronesians turned to selling handicraft and souvenirs to U.S. servicemen. I worked for the handicraft first, my job. And I can weaving the crochet and weaving the bandana cigarette case. I know how to make a string belt, something like that. And my older brother know the coughing. He can cough the man and woman. And uh, we have one handicraft shop. So many of the military coming, officers, military, and they buy all those things. They sold Marshallese woven baskets and cigarette cases, Ponapean dance battles, Chuki's love sticks, and Yappi's carved figures. But these new businesses did not last very long. The bulk of the military was shipping out, and as their presence dwindled, islanders had no market for their products. For those few in the Navy who remained in the islands, providing health services was a top priority, at least for a while. At first, U.S. medics worked through the population systematically, giving shots and immunizations to all. They said that as soon as they got the local doctor, that the American doctors could leave. And the guy that wanted to be a dentist was working for us before the war. And he became the dentist. <laughs> In a couple of months, he had a white jacket and he was a dentist <laughs> because the dentist wanted to get home as soon as possible. And so as soon as he was able to pull teeth, <laughs> he was a dentist. <laughs> I went in to, to, to check on my tooth because I had problem. And so he started to drill my tooth. And he would say, do you think I drilled it enough? Shall I drill a little more? <laughs> like healthcare, the school system as well had to be rebuilt. 
The schools were thatched huts, empty of all chairs and tables, or patched up buildings that had been all but ruined during the war. Still, they were schools. They were Japanese buildings, wooden buildings that were on piles. And there were classes in those buildings. They built a kind of not really good houses for kids to go to school. They just teach them the basics so that they can at least converse or understand each other. The Navy staffed the schools with whatever local teachers could be found. They didn't know what to do with the education. The teachers, you know, who's going to teach? So they started start training local to be teachers. But remember, they went to Japanese school. They cannot just pick them up and pluck them in and uh, they started teaching English. So they had to train them. So uh, when the Navy took over, they started teacher training. They got people, even like the old uh, Papa Etchite there, would, was, was one of the first English teachers with his German accent. Oh, well, then they appointed him as uh, starting to make a, a school to teach English. And Bailey Alter was one of his first students. And Ambrose Senta, Ed William Henry, they were the first students to learn English. Those few Micronesians who spoke English may have started out as teachers, but they quickly moved up the ladder to take other positions. These included some of the men destined to play a leadership role in the islands in later years. Ben Santos, uh, Ada, former Disted. Uh, F. Hunt's right around. David Remeroy. Oscar de Broom. Dwight Heine, who was afterward the district administrator here. Maria Taitano. Uh, Isus Owasi, Isus Sablon. The war-torn islands were being pieced back together again, and life was returning to normal. The 20th century had seen the arrival of Germans and then Japanese. It had ushered in peace, then war. Now, with peace restored, the Americans were taking their turn at the helm. assembly of representatives from all over the world held in San Francisco in 1945, the United Nations was founded. The structure of world peace cannot be the work of one man or one nation. It cannot be a peace of large nations or of small nations. It must be a peace which rests on the cooperative effort of the whole world. There can be no middle ground here. We shall have to take the responsibility for world collaboration, or we shall have to bear the responsibility for another world conflict. The United Nations offered hope to a war-weary world. And October 24th, United Nations Day, has been celebrated enthusiastically across Micronesia ever since. You know, the big day was the UN Day, October 24th, when everybody come in. And there was a spirit that was you don't see it today, where 
not only young kids, high school, college kids now play sports, even the older people, they had sports those days. But the United Nations also offered the U.S. a way to legitimize control over the islands it had taken during the war, much as the League of Nations did for the Japanese 30 years earlier. When the war was over, the people who had been involved in the military actions out here were convinced that the islands had very strong strategic value, and they wanted to be absolutely certain they would never be used in an attack against the United States again. The only way to be that sure would be to take them. If these islands were in the hands of a power which was hostile to the United States or to the free world, then uh, this would create some very severe problems indeed. These atolls, these island harbors, will have been paid for by the sacrifice of American blood, argued Admiral Ernest King in a public speech. And the U.S. Navy was determined to keep them. Twice earlier, after the Spanish-American War and after World War I, the U.S. had a chance to occupy the islands, but did not do so. The U.S. military resolved not to repeat the same mistake. But at the same time, we had signed a, con uh, a treaty with uh, the top uh, powers of the United Nations that none of the victorious powers would take any of the former colonies of the losing parties. So we were caught in a catch-22. For months, a debate raged in Washington on what to do with the islands. In the end, compromises were made, and the islands were to be made a colony. But not really a colony. In 1947, they finally reached a compromise, and that compromise was that Micronesia would be created as a strategic trusteeship. This is the only one that was ever created by the UN, a strategic trust territory. It gives us the power to maintain the islands as long as we wanted them, without any interference from anybody, any other power. The U.S. would have administrative powers broad enough to accommodate the desires of the military. It reserved the right to make military use of the islands and to exclude visitors from them. Uh, we were still obligated under the trusteeship agreement to improve the education and social services, improve the economic development, develop a political structure, and to prepare the people for eventual self-government or independence as they may choose. But it doesn't say when. Despite their new status, the Navy remained firmly in control of the territory until 1951. But the Navy, they were not trained to, uh, to administer any territory. They were trained to fight. So, you know, the headquarters of the uh, Trust Territory was not located in Micronesia. It was located in Honolulu. They were running Micronesia by remote control. The administrative policy of the U.S. was to let local people set the pace in development. As Admiral Lewis Denfield put it, government under the Navy was to be minimalist, so as not to interfere with the happy, simple life of these island people. But the Navy would soon find it necessary to interfere with a happy, simple life of the people, after all. Man peeks into the power of the universe. Plutonium, one small particle burst into this staggering energy. Temperature at the explosion center is perhaps 100 million degrees Fahrenheit. The terrific pressure caused winds up to approximately 1,000 miles per hour. It struck me as the most 
awe-inspiring and magnificent man-made spectacle I have ever seen in my life. The atomic bomb testing in the Marshall started right after the war in 1946, and it has devastating impact. The atom bomb is here. It exists. We must look to the future. We want to be prepared for any use of atomic energy that may become necessary, whether offensive or defensive. Even before the Micronesian Islands were accorded their formal status as a trust territory, the U.S. had found a use for them. As a nuclear testing site, where it could safely develop the bombs that had won the war. In May 1946, the people of Bikini were evacuated from their island so that atomic testing could begin. Now then, James, tell them, please, that uh, the United States government now wants to turn this great destructive power into something for the benefit of mankind. And that these experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction. I think he spoke to the effect that this was in God's hand. Um, the testing was, you know, for the good of all mankind to stop all, you know, uh, wars. The nearby island of Enuitok was also used for testing. The people from Bikini and Enuitok began what was to be a long migration from one island to another to find a suitable home. Some of them were moved to an island on Jalawit Atoll, some of them were moved to um, an island on Majuro Atoll, and I believe there are still some up on Majeto on this atoll. In all, 66 nuclear weapons were exploded on these islands between 1946 and the last test in 1958. The largest and most famous of these was a Bravo test, when a hydrogen bomb was exploded in Bikini, with the fallout carrying over several islands in the northern Marshalls. It was on March 1st, 1954, um, that the Bravo shot was detonated um, in, during the early morning hours. And my mom told me that um, my grandfather, you know, was throwing net um, to get some fish. Uh, all of a sudden, the Bravo shot exploded and he saw this huge fire of explosion, you know, coming up uh, into the sky uh, with various, you know, unique colors. And it was a scary moment. Uh, he ran back to their village and warned everybody to, like, stay indoor and you know, something is going on. What's interesting is, I don't think the people were being informed that the testing was going to take place. But most of the people of Rongelap and other nearby islands were exposed to the fallout from the nuclear blast. We are taking every precaution to be certain that no man is injured in any way as a result of this experiment. But 72 hours later, the military ships came and loaded the people, evacuated them to uh, Kwajalein Atoll and processed them, um, trying to make examination. Um, at that point, you know, skins were peeling off, uh, people were nauseated, um, hair falling off. Uh, my mom is one of those who were exposed to the nuclear testing fallout and she was mad evacuated 
uh, on an airplane to Quaj. But um, after that, uh, she was beginning to bury uh, grape-like, you know, jelly babies. Say pen. While the U.S. military was testing nuclear weapons in the Marshalls, it had other plans for Saipan. In the early 1950s, the island was used by the CIA to train Chinese nationalists for secret military operations. The Chinese Civil War was, a, was the stimulus, because we were training uh, guerrillas to drop behind Chinese lines, doing, you know, bombing bridges and nuisance stuff. Because uh, they were training them here, they couldn't bring them in in blacked out buses, and blacked out airplanes with no windows at night, with them in buses that had no windows, take them out to Marpy, so they would never know where they were in case they got captured by the enemy, they couldn't tell where they'd received their training. We have one ex-CIA man still here, I've had him in my class several times. He talks about, he found a guy that was identified as a, an agent, a communist agent. And the next day he got unscheduled parachute training. And they took him, put him in a plane and flew him out over the water at Marpy. He jumped out and unfortunately the parachute didn't open. And so when he hit the water, the catch boat that was supposed to go out there and pick him up after they landed, couldn't get the engine started fast enough. End of story. The complex that the CIA used for their secret operations would later serve other purposes. What is now the Capitol Hill Post Office it used to be the gym for the enlisted men movie theater. Where the governor is was the commanding officer's quarters. There were paved roads, there were a couple of hospitals, uh, there were schools. Life it was a much higher level at any place else in the trust territory. Only in 1960 was the program terminated and the Northern Marianas placed under civilian U.S. administration along with the rest of the trust territory. territory that could be called a genuine military base was Kwajalein. The atoll had served as an important U.S. air base since the final year of the war. And it's kind of interesting when you look at the history of the base itself because it's, it's the Frankenstein of the Pacific. <laughs> um, the base has been very literally mothballed on four different occasions um, since 1945. In 45, after the Second World War, the exact status of Kwajalein was questionable. And so um, they decided to start testing nuclear weapons on the northern atolls in the Marshall Islands, beginning with Bikini in 46. And that, of course, meant a ramping up of the base um, to support the nuclear testing. The Navy stayed there and they built it up. And they were operating the Marshall Islands out of Kwajalein. And the Marshallese were living on the end of the golf course on the west side, in camps and uh, tarpaulins and all that. That's where they were living. For over a decade, 
Wajalain served as a staging and support area for the atomic tests. And as Kwajalein grew, so too did the Marshallese population on nearby Ibai. They're building, starting to build places on Ibai. And I was, there were some others that came in as carpenter workers. By the late 1950s, however, the nuclear testing was winding down and the fate of the base was in doubt. It appeared that the, the base was going to close down um, because they were not going to be doing any more nuclear testing. Um, the Nike Zeus program came in and that sort of ramped the base back up again. The island of Kwajalein in the Pacific, where an anti-ballistic missile system is being perfected, whose job will be to guard against any possible nuclear attack from communist China. With this new program came new jobs, and Marshallese from neighboring Ibai began commuting to the island on a daily basis. Over the years, Ibai grew to be a bedroom community for the Marshallese working on Kwajalein. Kwajalein had become a key military installation in the territory, a status that it retains until today. Kwajalein, Saipan, and Uitok, Bikini. The U.S. had its military interests to provide for, even as it tried to fulfill its obligations to the people of its U.N. trust territory. Micronesia was indeed a special kind of trust. Micronesia. In April 1947, the United States assumed responsibility for administering authority under the Charter of the United Nations. The outstanding achievement politically has been the development of self-government. There is equal suffrage and the people are eager to participate in government. On election day, they flock to the polls to select the men and women who will represent them in the Congresses. There was a uh, policy on the part of the administering authority to develop local self-government. And municipal elections were the first things to get started. In time, Local political participation was expanded to include the election of representatives at district councils, the forerunners of district legislatures. Marshallans Congress was the first Congress in modern Micronesia. We formed in 1950. We had our own Marshall-wide body that did not legislate, but made plans and, and talked about concerns, including the nuclear testing. I think the Ponobo District Congress was organized in 1958, and Bailey was our first president. But those district legislators didn't, you know, they could only appropriate money uh, you know, locally derived, they cannot touch revenue from, from the trust territory. So their power was very, very limited. Even so, these new institutions, municipalities and island councils, eventually took on a life of their own. The 
The Insular Constabulary of the Trust Territory was organized in 1946 for the maintenance of law and order. They have little to do because the islanders are a peaceful people. My father's police force was comprised of two people, two guys. And they were, they had two lambretas, and that's how they patrolled the whole island. They had uniforms. It was a uniform that they copied from the U.S. military. Khaki shirt, khaki pants, either long or short. But very little problem those days. A lot of fighting, but it, it's this just rumbling around without any uh, weapon or anything. And the police come and stop it, and they just normally keep the peace and see, you know, if there is any problem. Dispensaries have been established on several islands, many of them staffed by islanders. Medical aid men are recruited from the islanders and trained in a Navy school. And so they sent three of us to uh, Guam Memorial Hospital in Guam in 1948. They call it uh, assisting medical officer training. They recruited uh, all over the in my colleagues area. In my classmate, there was Dr. Minoru, and Dr. Jose Saipanis, Nas Kanso from Truk, Aniol from Truk, Dr. Henry from Marshall, and myself, Ito Rallis from Pompe and Benjamin. Dr. Ezra Reklin, Dr. Treka Risoda, Dr. Arma Risoda, Dr. John Ayman, Dr. Isaac Lanui was also one of them. Whether as nurses, dental and medical assistants, or patients, the Islanders have welcomed the efforts of the Navy to enhance their physical well-being. The School of Nursing provides a three-year course. The young women are quick to learn and seem naturally skillful in caring for their patients. Education, too, the record is good. The youngsters are eager to acquire knowledge and are faithful students. Education was first given to the, to the municipalities as their responsibility. Some of them ended up paying their teachers in kind, you know, breadfruit, taro, fish, and some like where I come from in Europe, teachers just doesn't get paid. I taught uh, one year at the uh, Chalankanwa Elementary School, and then I moved to Haput, and the, the number of students was only nine. The first high school, only nine, and I was teaching uh, Western civilization. All the people appear to be more content as they gradually learn the new ways in the island training schools. This teacher's training school has a surprisingly varied curriculum. Before long, the early teacher training programs evolved into regular high schools. Pacific Islands Teacher Training School, Pitts, located in Chuuk, became a full four-year high school, drawing some of the best students throughout the territory. Our principal has a good voice. And I remember 
every time uh, we had an assembly, like Friday, then his favorite song is uh, Onward Christian Soldiers Marching. That's his favorite. And he got good, loud voice. So everybody was marching inside the uh, gym. It's graduation day. In this parade of smiling, well-dressed graduates lies visible proof of progress in both health and education under the trusteeship. The economy of the territory is dependent on COBRA, through the encouragement of the civil administration, the copra output was more than doubled. It is expected to continue to develop along with other resources. To develop these other resources, the United States Commercial Company was brought in. It opened new stores and encouraged new industries. They brought in uh, cattle, good breeds, to uh, strengthen the local herds. They had other kinds of uh, agricultural programs. Another step towards stabilizing the economy of the territory was the incorporation of the Island Trading Company in 1947 and the opening of branches on six islands. This trust territory project has encouraged the setting up of native trading companies, which are gradually replacing the government stores. The first store, the Saipan importer, and they asked people to buy stock five dollars each. We had the beginnings of Joe Ten beginnings of uh, Villa Gomez store. You had the bakery, Herman's Bakery, got started. And the Navy gave a complete bakery to Herman Sr., which got him started in the business. And he was furnishing bread to the troops who were still here. There were a lot of small bakeries, but the other companies were, you know, small takeout store where they have canned corned beef, canned milk, sugar, tuna, cigarette. Cigarette was always there, somehow. No filters. In those days, it was Lucky, Strike, or Camel. And so we had a store. Nante had a store. And then they organized a federated company. And so the Navy gave them licenses to operate business. So they were the first businesses on Ponape after the war. On every hand are seen evidences of the new, the American way of life. Schools, economy, health and sanitation, government. There is a newfound freedom for the people, but the placid, happy life in the villages still goes on. On June 30th, 1951, the civil administration of Micronesia will be transferred to the United States Department of the Interior and the Navy will be sailing away to leave its charges in other capable hands.
Life was slow paced during the 1950s. In towns and villages across Micronesia, people had settled back into the ordinary rhythms of island life. My mom and I used to come with my dad to Anna. And the buildings, they were concert buildings. And, you know, the, the buildings for TTC stores, they had a place where they get copra. They had a snack bar. They had a theater. And of course, the warehouse big, big warehouse, and the department store itself. I used to just walk in and look around and see all those uh, shelves of goods and, and all kinds of merchandise. Karor in the 1950s was a very dusty place because the roads were unpaved um, and uh, during the dry season the few cars would kick up a lot of dust. The transportation was very, very limited uh, in Kushai at that time. In fact, most people travel by boat. The road itself was like a, like a wagon trail road with two lines and the grass in the middle. You know, that was the road. Uh, it was not, a, not, a, not really much more than a path. But then there weren't that many trucks on the island anyway. There weren't very many vehicles. There were two trucks on that side of the island. One was in Malam village, belonged to the chief Klava, and um, his truck was the one that had a glass ball for a radiator. He had uh, old drums sitting next to coconut trees every few hundred yards or so going down the road. So th it, they would stop, put in the water in the glass ball, and go on to the next drum. The other truck was in Utwe village. That was, uh, it looked like something like an old army left over. And it always had four, four flat tires. And every time they wanted to use it, like for an emergency or something, when they had, they had to pump up each one of those tires. And it was pumped by hand, of course, in those days. So that was, how, that was transportation. There was only a few people in Metro in those days. Few cars, few people, road was not paved. Communication was hard. You have to go to the news amp radio. And uh, restaurant was very rare too, you know. Salesmen used to come and bring their own samples, canned tuna, and then eat for <laughs> ramen and say, <laughs> that's what they had for dinner. <laughs> And then they had the commissary where the volleyball court is in Wulgar here. They had the commissary there, and then right next to it, they had the freezer plant. They were making black ice as well as, uh, you know, storing all the military food. On top of the hill in the back was the, the club, the officers' club called the Coconut Rendezvous Club, was up there. But amid this sleepy island existence, there were some changes. Hints of what was to come during the tumultuous 1960s and 1970s. Micronesians were beginning to travel more. They were becoming acquainted with people from other island groups. Pacific Island Central School, or PICS as it was called, 
brought together students from all over Micronesia. Xavier High School, founded as a territory-wide Catholic school for the better qualified young men, offered the other early opportunity for a high school education. An educated elite was being molded for future leadership roles in the islands. They learned to um, work together, Kushayans, Yapis, Chukis, and this was very important for developing Micronesian leadership because a lot of Micronesians from different parts of Micronesia learned to live with each other. And uh, they became involved in politics. That's how the first Congress got started because they knew each other. Islanders were beginning to look beyond their own reef and get an exhilarating whiff of the good life in other places. The stage was being set for the full emergence of the islands into the modern world. <laughs>